Right, um, thanks for, for joining me. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk about an introduction to organic thinking, or as uh, my colleague used to say, Henry Bortoft, um, the sort of Goethe's participatory thinking. Um, I've made myself a list here, so if you see me looking down, it's because I've little post-it notes down here. Um, what we have to do is, is firstly to realise that we're thinking in a certain style. Even though we're thinking, we just think we're thinking. When in fact, what's happening is, is that we've been educated to think a certain way. Um, so we're not just thinking, we're actually doing the thinking as uh, an active process. So we're not actually passive. So what this means is, is that if we're doing the thinking and we're educated in a certain way to think in a particular way, then there must be, or there can be, a different way of thinking. And this, this relates to organics. The way we're taught to think is what we call materialistic or reductionist or fragmented. Now, this is not wrong. Now, what I will do when I'm talking to you is I will, I will actually repeat myself a few times because that's the only way to get things across slowly. So we have this fragmentation process. Now, this fragmentation process is also wrapped up in our language. And this has taken hundreds of years to come about. So what we tend to do is we think in a way which is bound up in our language and our language makes us think in a certain way. For example, the language is fra our language is fragmented. So it goes from subject, object, ad we can use adjectives, verbs, predicates. And this again makes us see the world in that fragmented manner. So when things are written in a holistic fashion, um, trying to avoid extremes, it becomes very hard to understand. So I have lots of people, um, patients, um, colleagues, osteopaths, who actually say, well, I've tried to read Goethe's work or, or Henry Bortos' work about Goethe and I can't even get past the first page. Yeah, um, the, the main reason obviously for that is because it's in a style in which we're not used to. And this style brings things together, whereas we want things in a nice linear format that's not separate. Um, this, this doesn't mean that thinking in this fragmented and materialistic way is, is wrong at all, because it's not. It's a natural development of society and culture. In fact, it, it, its roots can, be, can go way, way, way back, hundreds, well, a couple of thousands of years to the Greeks. But what we tend to look at is mainly from the sort of 17th century. So basically, we are stuck in the 17th century. Um, now, I think the main thing to think about at the moment is how we're doing the thinking. So what we're not aware of is that our thinking, now hang on, I've got a plastic bag here. Just imagine this plastic bag is your worldview. Everything you know is in here, okay? And this bag is the sort of parameter. So if we look inside, I've got a cat. Okay, that's nice. Tree. What's that one? Oh, evolution. A bridge even, okay? And a car. Is that a car? Yeah, that's a car. Right, now, what else have we got in here? Fish and a computer. Okay, now, this is your way of thinking. This is the way you've been taught throughout school, um, through your educated life. Now, Goethe's way of thinking is literally to take this worldview, or Weltanschung, as the Germans say, and literally turn it inside out. So, we've turned the bag inside out. There we are. Let's actually... And then what I do is put all our fishes and cars and computers back in the bag. Okay, so what that means is, is that we now have a, another way of thinking about the same things we were thinking about before. But what the things we were thinking about before, we thought that was the only way of thinking, which isn't true. Put that um, one of the best books at the moment about that is um, Goethe's Scientific Consciousness by Henry Bortoft. You can see that there. There we go. There we go. That's the book to use. Now, I'm going to touch on a few things in this book which will help us to, or hopefully, help us to communicate better so for you to understand a bit more. Um, to understand Goethe's way of seeing, we would have to experience it for ourselves. Now, that's important. That actually is important for osteop osteopathy itself as well. 
Um, because modern Western philosophy does not like you to have personal experience. It dismisses anything that you see as personal, as not being scientific and not being real. Um, this is known as sort of classical scepticism or, or Cartesian scepticism, which comes from Descartes, the philosopher, again from the 17th century. We could only really understand it by participation, which means we would each experience Goethe's way of seeing as the way in which our own mind became organised temporarily. This is the same as in osteopathy, because what we try to do is look at the, the, the discover of osteopathy, um, A.T. Still, Andrew Taylor Still, his work and say, oh, we must read all his work and we'll get the stuff out of it. Well, we're still doing that and we're no better. So what tends to happen is we're not looking at our personal experience. Um, Bortov goes on to say, this brings us to another problem. Um, if we believe that a way of seeing is only a subjective factor, which is what modern science says, or modern philosophy, then we must believe Goethe's way of seeing died with him. And this is interesting because Andrew Taylor Still, the doctor who discovered osteopathy, his son Charles Still said, it is the common, or it is a common opinion, that osteopathy will die with my father. So again, nobody understood Andrew Taylor Still, and this obviously has led to problems in the whole development of osteopathy. It didn't die with him. What happens is, is that you're expected to build upon your own experience. But again, as I say, modern science doesn't allow that. So, if this is so, the death bit, then any attempt to understand it will entail the absurd requirement of trying to become Goethe. That's going to be very hard since he's dead. So we're trying to reproduce what Goethe did, not deepen or develop our own experiences. But this problem disappears when it is recognised that what is experienced is a way of seeing, sorry, what is experienced as a way of seeing is the phenomenon or the unity of the phenomenon. So it's not a case of just looking and seeing the same way, it's your experiencing or being aware of your experience of doing the seeing that links you with the phenomenon and stops it being separate from you. Um, it follows immediately that any number of individuals can experience the same way of seeing without the restriction of time. A way of seeing that is temporal, sorry, a way of seeing has the temporal quality of belonging to the present instead of to the past. So again, osteopathy, we keep looking backwards to what, for example, Andrew Taylor Still said, the founder of osteopathy, and trying to mimic what he did. You know, he said this, he said that. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It's, we're always in the present. Henry Bortoff said to me once, you know, we're always in the present. It's always the time now. It's never the time yesterday or never the time next week. It is more like an event of perception in which we can learn to participate instead of repeating something which once happened and has now gone. This is why Andrew Taylor Still didn't teach manipulation formally, because what he did has gone. What I do to my patients yesterday, last week, has gone. It has no more significance. There's only the present. So we have to be attentive to the actual present in front of us. So Goethe himself had to learn to see in the way which we now call Goethe's way of seeing. We are unaware of ourselves being in the present, doing the thinking, having an experience. We think that whatever we say, um, whatever we read, or what we've even learned can be repeated. Nothing can be repeated. Now I'm going to jump a few few places here just to get to some interesting points. Okay, this is about knowledge. It would be easy to present Goethe's work, in this case on colour, as if it had been done in a purely empirical manner, that means just by senses. Um, the world which we know is not in fact visible to the senses. 
although this is easily overlooked. I can see you all going, oh, the, the, what do you mean by this? I can see. Oh, okay, right. Let's, let's, let's look at this again. We do see the world, of course, and this is what this is what Henry brought off saying. But as the well-known philosopher of science, Norwood Russell Hansen put it, there is more to seeing than meets the eye. If we want to understand what scientific knowledge is, we have to learn to recognize the extra non-sensory factor which transforms sensory experience into cognitive or thought process perception. This means learning to recognize the fundamental incoherence of empiricism as a philosophy of science. So again, it's not a case of just opening your eyes and seeing. So Bortov goes on, there is always a non-sensory factor to cognitive perception. Now I'm going to go over just a few more bits and then I go over the whole process again, just so we know what we're talking about, just to review it. The difficulty, has, difficulty we have in recognising this at first is a consequence of our identifying mind with a disembodied intellectual function. Okay, let's look at that again. With identifying mind with a disembodied intellectual function, which means mind and body separation. So what we're used to seeing is, or thinking, is the mind. We, when we say this, I, my mind says this, my body says that. So we become passive in the whole process. So we're disembodying things. A prejudice that has deep historical roots in Western culture and is institutionalized in our educational system. Okay, so let's just review that. Our senses are not seeing. So, so my eyes don't see, I see with my eyes. My hands don't write, I write with my hands. My thought processes are not separate from my body. There is no thought and body. Okay, it's a constant expression. I cannot see things without them being meaningful. So, for example, if you if you took I don't know um, let's, let's let's take this stapler for example. If I took this stapler to some indigenous population out in the Amazon who never had any paper to write on, it's actually meaningless to them. We're not aware of the fact that actually we develop meaning. We develop meanings with our language through our experiences, but there are two ways of doing it. So we've looked at the first way, which is our way of seeing, which is materialistic, numerical, uh, quantity based. Let's add that in there. So we're using numbers. So we say six foot, six meters, two kilograms, 10 pounds. The other way is the organic way in which we are not separate from the world. We are participating with the world. So this separation process is purely a cultural phenomenon through education. So everything you're thinking about is real for you. It's a personal experience. So what we have to do in osteopathy, or what I'm trying to get people to do in osteopathy, is to actually not palpate the patient, because there's nothing in the patient to palpate. They're not an object of containment. I'm trying to get people to realise if you if you deepen the experience you're having while your hands are on the patient, you feel more without breaking the patient up. Just one last thing. Um, one of the other things we talk about is fluidity or, or fluid in the patient. This, this is a misunderstanding. Uh, the patient is not fluid. Nature moves. We are in nature. We're all participating together. So what we have to change is the consciousness of the practitioner to be more fluid with the patient. Okay, so it's not the patient that contains fluidity, it's the osteopath mode of consciousness or way of thinking. Now obviously this cannot be done if we're still thinking with our carrier bag in a materialistic reductionist way. The way to be more fluid is to deepen the experience you're having while you're palpating. So the hands themselves are just carriers of the experience. They deliver your ideas. You don't use your senses. You cannot palpate with your senses. It's meaningless because the hands cannot sense. You have to make sense of your hands. So we are we think in a materialistic way, which is not wrong. It's quantity based. It's fragmented. It's abstract. 
This is all very well if you're going to build a bridge. If we want to think organically, it has to be participation, a consciousness of fluidity, a consciousness of uh, deepening of the experience. We have, and there's a methodology for this. Okay, so we can say materialistic, organic, experiment, experience, separation, participation. And that comes with everything. Participation comes with everything. So, for example, um, if you had a curry the night before and you were feeling someone's neck, it would affect you because you're part of the world. You're not separate from it. You cannot be objective. In fact, you cannot be subjective. This is all goes back to the 17th century. Right, I hope that's helped a little bit. Um, if you want to contact me, go to Facebook and look up McCone Osteopath and you can click like. Um, I'm on Twitter, to double check that, Twitter as McCone Osteo and also on Twitter as McCone Psych for all the psychology which we'll be looking at in the future. So McCone Psych is two words with P-S-Y-C-H. Anyway, thanks for listening. Um, more to come in the future.